This is the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, friends in IoT. Welcome to Let's Connect, the newest podcast in the IoT for All Media Network. I am Ken Briota, Editorial Director for IoT for All, and your host. If you enjoy this episode, please remember to like, subscribe, rate, review, and comment on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And to keep up with all the IoT insights you need, visit IoTforAll.com. Before we get into our episode, the IoT market will surpass $1 trillion in the next few years. Is your business ready to capitalize on this new and growing trend? Use Leverage's powerful IoT solutions development platform to efficiently create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. Help your customers increase operational efficiency, improve customer experience, or even unlock new revenue streams with IoT. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. Now, let's connect. Today's guests are Stu Gavron, the CEO, and Carson McDonald, CTO of OpSense. And today, we're going to talk about uh, real-time continuous monitoring in IoT. We're going to talk about the meeting of the software and the hardware and how we can make that mm, a lot smoother. And maybe even solve all of IoT and figure out how to uh, uh, make it ubiquitous, make it indoor plumbing, make it just work for everyone. Because I think that's probably the future that we all want. But for now, let's connect. Stu, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about your background and sort of how OpSense fits into IoT? Sure. Um, I'll try and make this short, even though I'm a little bit uh, long in the tooth. I'm part of the old guard. Um, back in the 80s, I was an engineer with companies like Boeing and eventually had a career uh, with Ernst & Young as a partner, leading what was at one point called the distributed computing uh, practice. So that brings back uh, memories of satellites and modems and other things that uh, people that listen now and think about IoT probably don't think about as much. But that whole world was helping enable companies, you know, to deal with the distributed problem, which is what IoT is about. Eventually became the head of a software products company called Mission Data, where I met Carson. And there we had a variety of clients. We built their products out and some were in the food uh, retail space. And they had some needs, uh, uh, particularly in um monitoring their environment for their distributed workforce of associates. That led us to the creation of OpSense, and then we founded it from there. Awesome. And, and Carson, welcome to the show. Uh, how, uh, how did you end up working in, uh, in OpSense and in IoT? Kind of like Stu, I've, I've been around for a while. Uh, I, I started off actually uh, years ago at IBM, uh, taking care of their parts of their system that, that handled uh, communication between their their printer technicians, which was actually a quite impressive system. From there, I, I kind of moved on to different roles at, at places, one of which was um, real-time embedded systems for a conveyor belt manufacturer that that um, did conveyor belts, specialized conveyor belts in warehouses. And that was kind of where I got my introduction to what I consider IoT. I spent the last uh, 20 years or so at Mission Data. I moved on uh, from doing uh, primarily software development and architecture to a uh, role as a vice president of R&D, where I brought a lot of the things that our customers considered cutting edge technology to them in a way that kind of met their business uh, needs. And from there, I transitioned into uh, the role as CTO at OpSense, where I'm kind of responsible for a lot of things, including the architecture and technology a lot of the relationships we have with hardware partners and kind of a lot of everything because we're not a large company. Well, I think we're going to jump right in here and I'm going to start with any luck by starting a fight <laughs> because uh, I know that at OpSense, you guys work a lot on the continuous monitoring, up-to-date data and, and use a term that really drives you up the wall real time because I don't think it exists. I don't know that it exists. And so I always ask, I like to ask people, what does real time really mean in IoT? What is the what is the benefit of all the work that would go into actually creating real time if it was real time? And and how how does does that work within what you guys are working on? Yeah, so I'm gonna start. So I'm gonna confess that real time's been a term that's been overused and incorrectly used for forever. And you know, there probably is nothing really called real time. There is kind of on time. 
<laughs> it's probably the best best way to do it. But let's talk about continuous monitoring. One of the things that uh, you know to join your fight um, on on way IoT has been used for a long time has been you know collecting data, analyzing data, you know maybe doing um, you know some corrective actions. Uh, when we talk about real time monitoring or or continuous monitoring. We're really dealing with workforces, you know. So Opsense is is, is purpose built for um, the food industry with you know a lot of brick and mortar. They could be food producers, like you know factories that make food, to groceries, to to restaurants, um, to even pharmacies nowadays. But let's just stick with others. And they have an obligation to make sure that what they have doesn't perish; that they don't get lose that inventory. Um, and they need real time monitoring. In the past, they've used a lot of humans to collect data and maybe upload it, et cetera. So IoT for a long time was focused on feeding data up, collecting it, thinking about it, and maybe there's an alarm and alert. And for us, real-time monitoring is really applying business rules that is at the cycle levels that our, our industry needs, the domains we're handling, handling needs so that they know if they're okay or not okay in the right amount of time and somebody within literally the right amount of time has the action they need to do to make sure that they're going to eventually be okay. So continuous monitoring means you're listening as quickly as you need to. It could be every few seconds to every half an hour. And real time means people are told what to do or know what to do on time. Hope that helps a little bit, Ken. It sounds a little bit like um, because you guys are so interested in the software layer and, and in that part of it, that, that, for you, the people involved in this, these executions are as important as the machines and sort of there's the, the layer in between them. The software is really the, the core of the, uh, of IOT for, for sort of your vision of the way things work. Is that a fair sort of construction there? I think it's right on target. I think our people don't care about our users, as we would say, don't care about IOT at all. Um, that's why it's called a monitoring system because that is a term they use. And we say equal, you know, actually the people are more important. Our whole view of software is you give them a user experience and, you know, abstract the under, underline that in a few seconds, they know what's going on and they know what to do so that they can optimize their time or their efforts. So, yeah, that's a long way of saying yes. <laughs> so if we call it uh, the Internet of People, we could say that OpSense is down with IOP. Absolutely. Uh, that, is like a, that is a bad, like I'm sorry. Listeners, I know that you're new to the show, and this is a little PSA for you. I should apologize in advance for every joke I'm going to make from here on out. I will not stop making them, but you will have to listen to them. So I'm sorry. Uh, moving forward, uh, we, we just started touching a little bit on software and, and, uh, and sort of that that's the, the layer that you find most interesting and, and are working with most often. Um, but of course, so much of, uh, the IOT discussion is around hardware. It's around the sensor. It's around the, the, uh, machines that are being tracked or the, the, the warehouse you know, itself or, or whatever is, is the, the item, uh, the processor, the SIM card or the eSIM or whatever. Um, so it seems like there's a, perceived friction between software and hardware in IoT. And I don't think that's necessary if it exists. And I'm not entirely sure that it exists. And so I'm curious about where and if you see a line between hardware and software and, and what what is required for a functional IoT solution. You know, is it is it IoT if it's all hardware? Is it IoT if it's all software? Is it IoT only if it's the joining of the two? Can you please answer this totally ineffable question? <laughs> Carson, do you want to try first? Sure. I, I think I think there's definitely a line. It, it's um, difficult to answer just because um, you know if you're a, an electrical engineer, you'd probably consider different things. Um, software that that aren't necessarily considered software um by somebody who's who's doing just software development but um yeah i mean there is a lot of i, I guess what i would say is a lot of the uh hardware is run by 
um, software for the most part, um, like pretty, pretty deeply uh, run by software. The, um, so there isn't a whole lot of, of um, uh, there's, there's not a real line there. Where the line usually gets drawn, I think, is where, where people feel comfortable uh, taking their software uh, development skills uh, into that world because it, you can get, you can get stuck pretty quickly uh, when you start working at the, what people consider the hardware uh, level uh, when you're writing your own firmware, which is what I would consider, uh, what an electrical engineer would consider their side of, of software on the, on the hardware itself. So. So, and I think this is one of those fundamental, you know, where the line is, Ken. So, I, I believe because a lot of the infrastructure types actually do develop software either for their infrastructure, their platform, or their hardware, they sometimes misunderstand, you know, the humans in, in the business in this process. I don't mean like they misunderstand them, like they don't care, um, uh, but they're not quite understanding what they need to consume and distill to do their jobs well. The information is delivered and it's even processed, but it, maybe it's not quite what a grocery worker or, or a food production person expects to see. So there's a little bit we find that the hardware guys are very open to the discussion once we talk about how we think about software versus what they do as opposed to a real argument. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Uh, I, uh, I like to try and start these arguments that aren't actually arguments because reasonable people go, oh, it's a little bit of both. And uh, I'm not a reasonable person. So sorry, guys, you're, uh, you're in the woods now. I didn't warn you, and you're stuck. Um, <laughs> uh, but that does transition beautifully into, I think, a place that we definitely agree and uh, is sort of a, a vision for future IoT and sort of where the industry uh, probably inevitably is going. And I think it, that that's a good thing, which is toward ubiquity toward the the hardware just working and being semi interchangeable the the software being user friendly functional rich at reporting and analyzing data at the edge because i think that's an important function that that everyone's working on that we haven't had time to talk about but uh, is is exciting stuff so um that's sort of a vision of of the iot that i have in the future, which is as as important as and thought of as little as plumbing in a house. You expect it to be there. It's only a problem if something goes wrong. It's usually a pretty big problem if something goes wrong, but you hope that it never does. And um, that's sort of what I like to think of the IoT as becoming in the industrial space, in the retail space, in the smart city. Uh, as sort of the background software infrastructure of functionally all of society. And I'd love to hear your point of view on that and, and whether or not you think that's a realistic vision, how you see it. Now, I'm going to start and, and probably Carson will add. So I think it's achievable, but there are a lot of barriers in the way. Um, so, Part of the, the the issue now is everybody's looking for a recurring revenue source. So software companies like ours build, build software as a service and people subscribe. Think of it as the old over-the-top question with the internet service provider. So, so here we are building an application that is using their infrastructure um, and the data that they're bringing. So you build this ubiquitous thing and it gets fed to us and we get to charge quite a lot of money for it, let's just say. I, I don't, you know, yeah. Obviously, not a lot, but, you know. And and the thinking underneath as you go through each layer of the infrastructure is why aren't I getting a piece of that recurring revenue? So I think technically it's possible, but I do think that there are these behaviors every player has and that the, the, the end of the rainbow is recurring revenue. So the platform guys want, you know, their, their recurring revenue as part of it, the... Um, Hardware guys want to make sure that their their part has a sort of recurring theme. And besides IEEE standards or ISO standards or the equivalent, we actually need probably a little bit of a, a marketplace or agreement or a revenue sharing model that allows us not to ultimately pile on subscription fees that crush. So I think technically we can get there, um, but I, I think unfortunately 
there is a little bit of um, what I would say uh, of everybody worrying about their slice of the pie. But maybe you're seeing it differently, but I think that is typically the human factor is harder than the technical factor. I agree. I think that the uh, the uh, that subscription fee is a looming sort of Damocles over the industry that we're going to have to figure out uh, at some point, or uh, the financials are going to stop making sense if we're just offering efficiency. Um, Carson, what do you think of my uh, my admittedly very optimistic vision? <laughs> I think I, I think I would probably I'm, I'm probably a little bit more optimistic um, about it in, in a way. I think technically there's there's really a very little barrier now. I think historically the issues always come down to connectivity and it's it's just been a problem, you know, forever. I, I think we're getting closer and closer to solving some of that. What what I think we've seen over the past few years is there are there are very large players in the field of what I would consider just uh, you know, internet pipes that could probably provide services that they're not providing maybe because they're looking to add new subscription services to existing platforms that they already have, as opposed to just rolling them into what most people would consider just backhaul. I, I think we're getting closer to that being something that just happens because there's a lot of pressure to connect things that I think they can't resist uh, forever. Um, and not everybody wants to use proprietary uh, platforms at this point. I think one of the things that's happened uh, pretty recently that that makes me feel more optimistic on this is the Amazon sidewalk announcement um, that they're finally rolling that out. I, I think that is is more towards a vision of of what the future could be, where you combine combine um, somebody who's already making hardware with with uh, somewhat long distance radio technology, um, kind of open it up. I don't think I don't know that they're necessarily completely open, but you don't even have to do that. You know, it's a lot of just baking it into the hardware that you're already deploying and then even charging, you know, charging extra for it as an as an add on uh, is even an option. I think most people would accept that it would definitely reduce the barrier to entry for a lot of people. I think it's inevitable that it will happen. I think we've got all the technology that we need to do. Uh, to do it. It's just a matter of time before the dam breaks and the first person really opens it up. I just want to say uh, thanks to both of you for joining me here on Let's Connect. And uh, I hope that my listeners have connected with you and uh, as much as I feel like I have. So thank you both for joining me. And uh, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Oh, that's a pleasure. It would be great to uh, get into um, another bit of hot topics with you at some point in the future. This was a lot of fun. I hope we can. Thanks again to all of you listening out there. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion, and if you have, please make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. We post every week, and I hope you'll leave us a rating, review, and comment on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to suggest a guest, please click on the link in the description. And we also have a great sister podcast on our network called the IoT for All Podcast, so make sure you check that out. Hey, Ken, let me jump in real quick and introduce your audience to another awesome show on the IoT for All Media Network, the show that started it all, the IoT for All Podcast, where I bring on experts from around the world to showcase successful digital transformation across industries. We talk about use cases and IoT solutions available in the market and provide an opportunity for those companies to share advice to help the world better understand and adopt IoT. So if you're out there listening and haven't checked it out, be sure to go check out the IoT for All podcast available everywhere. Thank you, Ryan. Now get back to your show. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Let's Connect. I've been Ken Briota, Editorial Director of IoT for All and your host. Our music is Sneaking on September by Otis McDonald. And this has been a production of the IoT for All Media Network. Take care of yourself. You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network.